Thank you all for uh, attending today. Um, it is a great honor to be here and to be able to present to this symposium. Um, my name is Max Bodrachari, and I lead robotics for uh, the Toyota Research Institute, or TRI. Um, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about how we think about robotics innovation, and in particular, how we think about robotics to amplify rather than replace people. I'm first going to start with uh, two trends that I think you are all aware of, but I'm going to remind you about what they are. The first trend is that aging society is a national crisis in Japan. If you look at the, the year um, and the percent of the population that will be over 65 in Japan, in 2030, 30% uh, of the population will be over 65. And in 2050, 38, almost 40% of the population will be over 65. Said differently, um, the, the idea of a caregiver ratio, the ratio of the people who are over 65 compared to those who could care for those who are over 65, in 2030, the, the ratio will be 6 to 10 uh, people. But by 2050, that ratio is almost 1 to 1. So for every person who is over 65, there will only be one person who might be caring for that person. This is also uh, a worldwide phenomenon. It will happen in China and in the United States, but just at a slower rate. Another trend that I want to talk about is about technology and AI, machine learning, and robotics displacing labor. And so we know that um, automation, in, in particular industrial automation, um, is adopting many of these practices. And we have to admit that it is going to displace traditional labor. But the story is not that simple. Um, if you look at one historical example, for example, in the United States, um, in the 1990s, uh, automatic teller machines uh, dispensing uh, money uh, grew significantly. So you can see the bottom line um, is, is the increase in ATMs in the United States. And the fear was that this would replace the human tellers from their jobs. And it did for a very small period of time. But then what actually ended up happening is human tellers actually increased because they could use what they were good at doing, in fact, helping people get loans, um, performing other more complex transactions. And ATMs created many more branches throughout the United States. So it actually resulted in an increase in the number of human jobs that were performing uh, the teller uh, operation. So why does Toyota care about these two trends? Um, manufacturing at Toyota will have a huge impact. Um, for example, Toyota Motor Corporation's production is one of the largest in the world. We produce almost 10 million cars every year. We have a global footprint, including uh, 20 manufacturing facilities in Japan and 50 others worldwide. And so Toyota has made a huge investment in manufacturing. What's interesting is Toyota's philosophy about manufacturing and automation, though. Um, you've probably heard of the Toyota production system, which is based on two principles. One, just in time to reduce the amount of waste that's being produced. Um, and the other, the concept of jidoka, which is automation with a human touch. What's important about Toyota manufacturing, or interesting about Toyota manufacturing, is that of all of the other car companies, we have the least amount of fully automated uh, robots in production. And instead of having fully automated robots, we actually focus on mechanisms that help humans perform their tasks better. So we have this idea of karakuri, or a mechanism that can help a person perform a task. So here, it is not an automated robot performing the task of, of putting on the tire but rather a mechanism that helps a human do their job. So the human is producing all of the intelligence and the creativity, um, and also helping to create the mechanism that helps the person perform the task. And not only is the robot helping the person in this case, but it is also true that the human is creating the mechanism and therefore feels uh, fulfilled 
when he uses that mechanism and is in, encouraged to create more mechanisms to create even more productivity on the line. So rather than automate the line once and then make it very difficult to change, we think of constantly improving the, the line with using factory workers who are actually adding creativity to those mechanisms. So how does this uh, factor into our innovation strategy at the Toyota Research Institute? So we think about the, this notion, the Japanese notion of ikigai. Um, it is the combination of what you are good at, what you can be paid for, uh, what the world needs, and what you love. And we believe that uh, this is what helps create this notion of fulfillment in people, um, the notion of ikigai. And we feel like this is very important for um, particularly these two trends. So for example, how can we leverage technology to create fulfillment in industrial automation, where we go from humans who are building the uh, actual products to instead creating the mechanisms that, or the machines that actually help produce those products, and for aging society, where people go from being consumers of society, um, just buying goods, to actually creating and contributing back to society, being part of society. How can we use technology to empower people to become the creators, the artisans, or even just the people who help the rest of society, um, even as they age in society? The way that we think about innovation at TRI, um, we take inspiration from several sources, which may be a little bit counterintuitive. The first is corporate labs, um, historical large corporations that have invested in corporate labs, and one of the most successful is the AT&T Bell Labs model. Second is this notion that is used at DARPA, the United States um, Defense um, Advanced Research Projects Agency, um, which focuses on um, new technology for the United States Department of Defense. And finally, Silicon Valley um, and the venture capital model that's produced in, in Silicon Valley and the corp cor corporations that uh, create, that are the part of Silicon Valley. And we want to take the best parts of all of these types of models. So for example, why was Bell Labs so successful? It had large amounts of resources and as a result could attract the best talent and it gave them significant, it gave its uh, contributors in, um, amounts of autonomy. Um, and it was also linked to AT&T, the company, very closely so that they could pull in those innovations. At DARPA, it's a little bit of a different model. Here, uh, program managers come in for a very short period of time, two to four years, and in that very short period of time, they have to create a, a program that is a collaboration between um, academia, industry, and federal labs um, working with the, the, the US military to identify what are the really hard problems um, that these groups can try to address. And they've taken the mentality that they go for extremely high risk approaches, but have realized that failure is going to be common. And so they are very tolerant to failure. And it is built into the culture that allows them to go after the very high risk, but high payoff um, projects, which have resulted in some of the most important breakthroughs to the world, and not specifically to the military. And finally, what has made Silicon Valley so successful? In addition to um, the venture capital model of including, you know, starting with many, many seed projects and then slowly funding only the successful ones, there's this very interesting notion of cooperation among the companies in Silicon Valley. And it is accepted and it is part of the culture that people will move jobs every few years. And what's important about that is that they take their ideas from one company and bring it to other companies. And everybody embraces this idea, and it makes all of the companies better. It also uh, leverages the best of what the universities that are around it, uh, Stanford, Berkeley, um, and many others, and pulls both the talent, the students, as well as the professors and many of the ideas into the corporate world. So, 
the way that we incorporate this idea, rather than trying to think about doing incremental improvements for factory automation or you know, targeting products, we actually think about defining our own grand challenge problems, which are not necessarily related to specific applications or specific products. Those force us to work on breakthrough capabilities to solve these problems. Um, but it's also important to make sure that we ground these problems in real problems, real factory problems, real logistics problems, um, ways that we can help people in their homes. We have a separate organization then that looks at how do we take those ideas, prototype them, validate them, and show that there's a valid business model, and we iterate on that with that organization. And then finally, when we've de determined that we have a valid business model, we look at ways to actually develop those into product concepts, scale them up, and cost them down. So you might ask, um, why doesn't Toyota Research focus on what are the simplest um, low-hanging fruit in the factory? Um, if you look at difficulty in terms of robotic capabilities, um, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit for AI, ML, and robotics in manufacturing, and Toyota is such a large manufacturing organization, there's much that we could do to focus on incremental improvements in the factory. We could also look at logistics, which is a little bit more difficult, or care facilities, or homes, which seem like a much farther, hard-to-reach market. But we, instead of focusing on manufacturing or the factory, at TRI, our goal is actually to focus on homes. And the reason we do that is because we think that if we focus on the homes, truly helping people in their homes in incredibly diverse and difficult environments, that will create a paradigm shift that will eventually change the way that we do manufacturing. But we don't only invest in research for the homes. It's still important to invest in improving manufacturing, logistics, and care facilities, because that is the way that true commercialization will happen. In order to bring uh, costs down, to get reliability up, um, that will actually go the reverse. It will start in manufacturing and then propagate to many other, uh, many other domains. So our philosophy is to think about how can we help people, how can we amplify and empower people in their homes. But we don't only think about one home. We actually think about, well, what if all homes, just like factories of the future, would be connected? And so you could have a whole series of connected homes talking to each other. And even furthermore, what if that was part of a larger connected city, where instead of um, aging in place and then going to a hospital, it was all part of one connected system. And so we know that as people age, they're going to need to go to places like hospitals for some amount of care. But what if we could keep them in their homes for longer, um, getting the care that they need in the hospital, but then continuing that care when they ba went, went back home? So what have we been doing to uh, you know, further this strategy? Um, we focus primarily on this idea of fleet learning for robots, the idea that as one robot learns, it could share its experiences with many other robots, and they can all simultaneously learn that skill. So whether it's in the factory of one robot learning how to do one skill and then propagating that both to other machines in that factory or beyond the factories, or robots in one home uh, learning one skill and then propagating it to all robots in other skills, um, the robots can learn collectively. And this is critical for creating the capability and the robustness that is going to be required in connected factories or homes of the future. This notion of fleet learning has four aspects of it. Memory-based autonomy, the idea that we can have autonomy, we can teach the robots how to do something, and we have large amounts of cloud storage. And so when robots recognize the situation they're in, they can apply that autonomy. The idea that robots should be able to learn from people, that we are not going to always, we are not going to be able to program robots to perform all of the tasks that they are going to need to do. And so we must be able to teach the robots on the fly from people interacting with them. And that robots could also learn on their own 
from imagination or, or the idea of simulation, where if we can simulate the world sufficiently well, the robots can explore in this virtual environment how to perform tasks and then actually learn to improve themselves or perform completely new tasks. And finally, once they do learn, whether it's from people or from their own imagination and simulation, that they can share these experiences across many other robots. And so that robots learning in one domain, one experience, can actually share it and generalize to other experiences. So here are just some examples of the things that Performing we're Performing tasks in homes is extremely challenging for robots. Each home is unique, with a large number of objects arranged in different configurations. We demonstrate the effectiveness of our approach by presenting results for a variety of tasks under different environmental conditions in our lab and in real homes. So, rather than try to program a robot to do a specific set of tasks, like an assembly line robot, our robot can learn new skills from a human teacher. We teach the robot in VR, or virtual reality. The teacher can see a model of the robot, as well as the live data from the robot itself. And it uses that information to teach behaviors that are linked to things in the environment. And that's important because rather than teach the robot a set of direct motions to a very specific instance of the environment, we teach the robot parameters. That's part of a set of safe behaviors. And that's robust to a changing environment. For example, we can teach the robot how to open a refrigerator. We show the robot where to place its gripper, how to hook the handle, and also how hard to push. We can teach the robot about what objects in the scene are important, or what parts of an object are important, whether the object is a bottle or the refrigerator handle. Whichever the object is, wherever the object is, we can teach the robot how to handle it. We can also teach the robot about uneven surfaces in the home, those that it can drive over and those that it cannot and we can teach it these things with just a very few examples. And once one robot learns that skill, it can pass that skill on to other robots. We call this fleet learning. Like simulation, we believe that teaching is a key capability that will enable robots to be useful in homes. So I want to emphasize that the robot that you're seeing here is clearly not a product. And we don't necessarily think that a general purpose robot is going to be the end state of what is helping people in their homes. Um, and in particular, uh, we think the analogy to the factory is we don't think that we will have a general purpose robot in a factory doing many different things. But we focus on a general purpose robot because it pushes the way that we think. It forces us to think completely differently and then shift the way that we approach the problem and then use that in other ways, in more specific applications. And so it really helps create the paradigm shift that we're looking for. Um, I'll show you in the same next video, the same is true. Um, our goal is not to build, for example, you'll see a dish loading robot, a dishwasher loading robot. The goal is not because we believe that a dishwashing loading robot is important, but because it creates a test bed for us to use simulation and change the way that we approach robotics with simulation. Traditionally, robotics researchers have used physical testing to design their algorithms, but that's just too slow. We've seen a dramatic increase in the performance of our system. One of the big reasons for that has been our increased capabilities in terms of simulation and testing. We want to be able to test our algorithms in software in the same way we test them in hardware. In simulation, we can run many more tests and more diverse tests than what we run in the real world. Every night, we generate random configurations of the sink with random objects, trying to find the corner cases, the rare events, the situations that we never thought to try in physical test. The next wave is having the algorithms repair themselves when we find a counter example, a corner case, the algorithm will automatically fix itself so that it doesn't make that mistake again. We finally reached the point where we do most of our design work in simulation and have a lot of confidence that if it did it right in simulation, it's gonna work in the real world. And that's a place that we haven't been before in the field of manipulation. So 
those are just some examples of the type of grand challenge problems that we focus on. But it's not enough to just focus on the technology problems. What we want to do is figure out ways to actually have an impact on society and the world. And so what we do to close that loop is brainstorm ideas about how these capabilities, the use of fleet learning, simulation, um, and all of the manipulation capabilities that we're developing, how can that actually have an impact on people? So what we've been doing to close that loop is actually coming up with ideas that we can show to real people in homes. So for example, these concept sketches where um, a person uh, might be uh, elderly and requiring robotic assistance. And we don't know if these ideas are good, the idea of a, ro a mobile robot in your home or movable furniture or things that can remind you when to take your medicine. But what we would like to do is demonstrate these capabilities to people, ask them, how would you feel if you had these capabilities in your home, and then use that as a feedback cycle to know what can we focus on in terms of capabilities. And again, what's important is we want to focus on how do we empower and help people. So if somebody, for example, loves to cook, what, we don't want the robots to do the cooking themselves. We want to make um, the robots help a person and empower a person so that they can do things that they otherwise wouldn't have been able to do as they age. And I think that this is true of factories and logistics and Toyota's general manufacturing philosophy of how do we empower people rather than replace them. So to conclude, um, how do we think about robotics innovation? Uh, we think that what's key is that robotics should amplify and not replace people. And if we can do that, we can focus on ways to utilize human creativity, human intelligence, and keep empowering them and creating even more jobs rather than replacing those jobs and displacing the labor completely. We want to focus on creating a paradigm shift by focusing on the hard domains first, really pushing us to change the way that we think because the problem seems so hard, so impossible, that we need a completely new way to think about solving the problem. And finally, we want to tie it back to real impact in the real world and achieve transformations in both industrial automation and the aging population. And so we feel like if we can achieve these three things, that's how we can use uh, robotics innovation to truly create a transformation to amplify people rather than replace them. Thank you.